The listening part of occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now. Look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Deschamble. For questions one to twelve, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. May I come in? Yes, please be seated. May I know your problem? Well, I'm a patient with marginal B cell lymphoma, for which I had a splenectomy two years ago. But last year, I developed a diffuse large B cell lymphoma that was treated with CHOP reduction. The disease again went into complete remission. Okay. Then what happened now? I was doing well until recently, a few days ago, late last week. When a swelling developed on my left testicle, I had fevers and chills for the past few days, and I felt weak. What's your age? Forty-five, doctor. Do you drink or smoke? Well, I used to smoke and drink, but I quit completely. Your previous illness and surgeries? I had B cell lymphoma, and diffuse large cell lymphoma. I had splenectomy. Are you taking any medications? No, doctor. Are you allergic to any medications? No, doctor. May I know your family history of illness? Well, my mother had paralysis before she died at seventy. My father is deceased at the age of eighty-four of a head and neck cancer. My fifty-six-year-old brother with type two diabetes and blindness, secondary to diabetic retinopathy. My forty-one-year-old younger brother has hypertension, and my younger sister has thyroid disease. Okay. Well. As per the laboratory data, your white blood count is thirteen point eight, hemoglobin fourteen point three, hematocrit forty two point four, platelets two hundred and thirty five thousand. SMA seven shows a potassium of three point nine, glucose is two hundred and thirteen. Physical examination shows no conjunctival pallor or icarus, no adenopathy. No cortitoid brutes, lungs are clear, no gallop or murmur in heart. Your right testicle is markedly erythematous and swollen and tender. Endocrine shows symptoms of type two diabetes mellitus. You have left testicular swelling. It is tender. Etiology: possible epididymitis or possible torsion of the testes. You have a history of diffuse large cell lymphoma and remission. You have a history of marginal B cell lymphoma. Status post splenectomy two years ago. You have a history of diabetes mellitus. I recommend that you have the ultrasound tests done for scrotum and abdomen. I will ask for CT scan of abdomen and pelvis after seeing the ultrasound reports. I am prescribing IV antibiotics. See me once you receive the ultrasound test reports.
Extract 2 Questions 13 to 24 You hear a physician talking to a patient called Thomas Andrews. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Yes, good morning. What's your problem? Well, Doctor, I have a sinus problem. I get post-nasal drainage, facial pain, headaches, sore throat and congestion. Since how many days have you been facing this problem? For the past two weeks, Doctor. I'm also getting snoring, teeth pain and nasal burning. Is it moderate or severe? It worsens in the evening and morning. What's your age? 47, Doctor. Did you have any illness previously or any surgeries? Yes, surgeries. Gallbladder and hernia. Do you drink? Smoke? I don't drink, but I smoke one pack of cigarettes per day for the past 15 years. Any of your family members have any illness? Yes, I have a family history of allergies and hypertension. What are the medications you are taking? Claritin, Dilantin and rhinocort nasal spray. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, Doctor. Well, your Oracle's external auditory canals reveal no significant abnormalities bilaterally. TM's intact with no middle ear refusion and are mobile to insufflation. Your intranasal exam reveals moderate congestion and purulent mucus. Your oropharnics examination shows teeth, alveolar ridges reveal missing molar. Examination of the posterior pharynx show a prominent uvulva and prominent postnasal drainage. The palatine tonsils are 2 plus and cryptic. The palpation of anterior neck reveals no tenderness. Examination of the posterior neck shows mild tenderness to palpation of the suboccipital muscles. Facial examination shows there is bilateral maxillary sinus tenderness to palpation. Waters view x-ray reveals bilateral maxillary mucosal thickening. You have acute maxillary sinusitis. 461.0 Snoring 786.09 Well, I am prescribing you Augmatin 875 milligrams twice a day and Mucofen 800 milligrams twice a day. Follow these medications for three weeks and meet me after that. If the conditions don't improve, then I will order a mini sinus CT. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, Choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question 25. You hear a discussion between a doctor and nurse about hypoxia and its causes. Now read the question.
Hello, Doctor. What is hypoxia and what are its causes? Well, hypoxia means low oxygen but is described as a deficiency in the amount of oxygen that reaches the body tissues. Hypoxia differs from hypoxema, which means insufficient amount of oxygen in the blood. In hypoxic hypoxia or hypoxema, the tissues do not get adequate amount of oxygen since there is a lack of oxygen in the blood flowing to the tissues. Generally, hypoxic hypoxia is caused due to inadequate breathing and other causes. In anemic hypoxia, low levels of haemoglobin lead to a decreased ability of the blood to carry oxygen that we breathe in. Therefore, the tissues get a diminished supply of oxygen. The stagnant hypoxia, or circulatory hypoxia, is caused due to inadequate blood flow resulting in less oxygen supply to the tissues. In histotoxic hypoxia, the tissues are incapable of utilising the adequate amount of oxygen available, despite the adequate oxygen inhaled through the lungs and delivered to the tissues. Metabolic hypoxia occurs when there is excessive demand for oxygen by the tissues than usual. Oxygen may be absorbed, transported and used properly by the tissues. However, due to a condition that raises metabolism, it is still insufficient. Sepsis is a perfect example of this. Question 26. You hear a lecture about the disease called botulism. Now read the question. Botulism is a serious illness caused by the botulinum toxin which causes paralysis. Paralysis begins in the face and spreads to the limbs. When the condition reaches the breathing muscles, it can result in respiratory failure. The toxin is produced by the type of bacterium called Colstriditum botulinum. Foodborne botulism occurs by eating foods contaminated with botulinum toxin. Common sources of foodborne botulism are in properly canned, preserved or fermented foods. Wound botulism occurs if the spores of the bacteria get into a wound and make a toxin. Patients who get injections have a greater chance of getting wound botulism. Iatrogenic botulism occurs when excessive botulinum toxin is injected for cosmetic purposes, such as for wrinkles or for medical reasons, such as for migraine headaches. Infant botulism occurs if the spores of bacteria enter into the intestines of an infant. Adult intestinal toxema botulism is a very rare kind of botulism that occurs when the spores of the bacteria enter into the intestine of an adult, grow and produce the toxin. Generally, patients with a severe health condition that affect the gut may be more likely to get this disease. You hear a discussion about gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now read the question. Doctor, what are the different causes of gastroesophageal reflux disease? Gastroesophageal reflux disease, or heartburn, is caused in many different ways. 
If the lower esophageal sphincter dysfunctions, then the lower esophageal sphincter will not close completely after the food reaches the stomach. Stomach acid will then back up into the esophagus. A hiatal hernia occurs when the upper part of the stomach is thrusted upwards into the chest through an opening in the diaphragm. This occurs due to a weakening in the diaphragm or due to increased abdomen pressure such as with obesity. This opening is called the esophageal hiatus or diaphragmic hiatus. It is considered that a hiatal hernia weakens the lower esophageal sphincter and cause reflux. When a patient has a motility disorder or slow stomach emptying is caused due to a problem within the muscle itself or a problem with the nerves or hormones that control the muscle contractions. Over 50% of the patient with gastrointestinal reflux disorder have abnormal nerve or muscle function in their stomachs, resulting in impaired motility. Esophageal irritation is caused when certain types of food, drink, smoking and medications can directly irritate the lining of the esophagus. In such conditions, it makes a difference to take the pill with a full glass of water and to stay upright after taking medicines for about 30 minutes. Question 28. You hear a discussion about congenital myopathy and its types. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is congenital myopathy and what are its types? Congenital myopathy means that a person is born with myopathy. Sometimes a hereditary medical illness does not develop symptoms until a person grows into an adult. Mitochondria myopathy is caused by a defect in the energy producing part of the cell called the mitochondria. There are several types of mitochondrial myopathy which are caused by hereditary mutation abnormalities in the genes. However, they can also occur without any family history. Metabolic myopathy is a group of diseases caused by metabolic problems that interfere with the muscle function. Generally, this condition is caused by defects in the genes that code for certain enzymes that are essential for normal muscle movement. Nemaline myopathy is a group of disorders characterised by the presence of structures called nemaline rods in the muscles. Nemaline myopathy is often linked with respiratory muscle weakness. Central core myopathy is an inherited disease causing weakness, bone problems and severe reactions to some medicines. Muscular dystrophy is a group of diseases caused by degeneration of the muscle or abnormality formed muscle cells or abnormally formed muscle cells. The main difference between myopathy and muscular dystrophy is that muscles do not function properly in myopathy, whereas the muscles degenerate in muscular dystrophy. Question 29. You hear a discussion about primary brain tumours. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what are the types of primary brain tumours? Well, there are many types of primary brain tumours which are named according to the type of cell or the part of the brain in which they start. For instance, most primary brain tumours begin in the glial cells. This type of tumour is called a glioma. 
Among adults, the most common types of brain tumors are astrocytoma tumor arises from star-shaped glial cells called astrocytes. It can be any grade. In adults, an astrocytoma most often arises in the cerebrum. Oligodendroglioma tumor begins from cells that make the fatty substance that encases and protects nerves. It usually occurs in the cerebrum. Oligodendroglioma tumor can be either grade two or three. Meningoma tumor begins in the meanges. It can be grade one, two, or three. It's usually benign grade one. And grows gradually. Question thirty: You hear a discussion about different types of aspergillosis. Now read the question. Doctor, what are the different types of aspergillosis? Well, aspergillosis is a disease caused by aspergillus, a common mold or a type of fungus that lives indoors and outdoors. Commonly, people breathe in aspergillus spores daily without getting sick. However, people with weak immune systems or lung diseases are at higher risk of developing health problems due to aspergillus. There are different types of aspergillosis. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis causes inflammation in the lungs and allergy symptoms such as coughing and wheezing, but doesn't cause an infection. Allergic aspergillus sinusitis causes inflammation in the sinuses, and symptoms of a sinus infection are drainage, stuffiness, or headache. In the contagious aspergillosis, aspergillus enters the body through a break in the skin and causes infection, usually in patients with weak immune system. Aspergilloma, also called a fungus ball, it is a ball of aspergillus that grows in the lungs or sinuses, but usually does not spread to other parts of the body. Chronic pulmonary aspergillosis is a long-term condition that lasts for about three months, in which aspergillus can cause cavities in the lungs. One or more fungal balls may also be present in the lungs. Invasive aspergillosis is a serious infection that usually affects patients with weak immune systems, such as organ transplant or a stem cell transplant patient. Invasive aspergillosis most commonly affects the lungs, but it can also spread to other parts of the body. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions thirty-one to forty-two, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at extract one. Extract one, questions thirty-one to thirty-six. You hear the lecture given by a physician on different categories of strokes and their location. You have ninety seconds to read questions thirty-one to thirty-six.
Doctor, please explain different categories of strokes and their location. Well, there are many different types and categories of stroke. The two main types of strokes are defined by their location and by the cause of tissue damage in the brain. Cause of tissue damage Often the causes can help determine the prognosis and appropriate method of treatment. Stroke caused by a blood clot is known as ischemic stroke, caused due to the lack of blood supply, oxygen and vital nutrients to a specific region of the brain tissue. An ischemic stroke may be caused by an embolus, a blood clot travelling from another part of the body. It may be caused by a thrombus as a result of a cerebrovascular disease. Or it may be caused due to vastospasm, the sudden severe narrowing of a blood vessel in the brain. Bleeding of a blood vessel in the brain results in a hemorrhagic stroke. At times the rupture of a brain aneurysm causes bleeding. Extreme changes in blood pressure may trigger the rupture of a brain aneurysm. At times, a region of the brain that was damaged by enzymic can bleed within the first few days after a stroke, causing a secondary haemorrhage. A watershed stroke is caused by low blood pressure or low blood flow, compromising the blood supply to susceptible regions of the brain. A watershed stroke may occur in areas of the brain that are supplied by tiny arteries. Strokes are also characterised by their location since the affected part of the brain links to specific neurological or behavioural deficits. A cortisol stroke affects the cerebral cortex that controls high-level processing. Different parts of the cerebral cortex control different functions. Frontal cortex or frontal lobe stroke often causes muscle weakness on the opposite side of the body and trouble with decision making. Patients with a stroke involving the frontal cortex may display socially inappropriate behaviour, paranoia or may regress in maturity. Occasionally, this may result in loss of bladder or bowel control. The paratial cortex is involved with integration of language and sensation. Patients with a paratial stroke often display impaired sensation or trouble with speech. The occipital cortex involves vision. Therefore, a stroke in this area may cause partial or complete loss of vision on the opposite side of the occipital region affected. The temporal cortex is involved with language and hearing. Patients with a temporal lobe stroke often have trouble understanding the spoken or written language. A subcortal stroke affects the deeper regions of the brain. Usually, a thalamatic stroke causes significant sensory deficits on the opposite side of one or more parts of the body, even when the stroke affects a relatively small region of the brain. A stroke affecting the internal capsule may affect sensory or motor function of one or more parts of the opposite side of the body. A brainstem stroke causes a wide variety of symptoms and signs. It may cause weakness, sensory changes or troubled speech. This condition can affect the movement of the opposite side or the same side of the face or mouth. Patients with a brainstem stroke may have trouble with eye movements, manifesting a double vision or blurred vision. In addition, the brainstem controls breathing and regulates the heart rate. A brainstem stroke may affect vital functions, even when a relatively small area is affected. Some strokes are named after the blood vessel that was bleeding or blocked. 
The most commonly identified blood vessel in a stroke is the middle cerebral artery that causes a large cortical stroke affecting the temporal and parietinal lobes. Now look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on the hemolytic anaemia. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello everybody, I am going to explain to you different types of hemolytic anemia. Hemolysis is the breakdown of red blood cells that typically has a lifespan of 120 days. After this duration, they die and break down. One of the main functions of red blood cells is to carry oxygen to every part of our body. Therefore, in case the red blood cells break down abnormally, there will be very few of them to carry oxygen to our body parts. Certain diseases and conditions cause red blood cells to break down too early, resulting in fatigue and other more severe symptoms. There are different types of hemolytic anemia and the conditions can be either inherited or acquired. Let me explain to you certain disorders and conditions of different types of hemolytic anemias. Inherited hemolytic anemias usually occur due to a faulty gene that control red blood cell production. While moving through the bloodstream, abnormal red blood cells may be fragile and break down. Sickle cell anemia is a severe inherited disease where the body produces abnormal haemoglobin, causing the red blood cells to have a crescent or sickle shape. Sickle cells usually die within 10 to 20 days as the bone marrow can't produce new red blood cells fast enough to replace the dying red blood cells. In the US, sickle cell anemia mainly affects African Americans. Thalassemias are the inherited blood disorders where the body can't produce certain types of haemoglobin in adequate quantity, causing the body to produce less healthy red blood cells. Hereditary spherocytosis occurs when the outer covering of red blood cells called the surface membrane is defected. In this condition, red blood cells have an abnormally short lifespan and a ball-like or sphere shape. Hereditary elliptocytosis or oval cytosis causes a defective cell membrane in which red blood cells are abnormally oval in shape, 
are not as flexible as normal red blood cells and have a shorter lifespan than healthy cells. Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency occurs when the red blood cells are missing an important enzyme called G6PD. The lack of enzyme causes the red blood cells to rupture and die when they contact certain substances in the bloodstream. For the patients with G6PD deficit, severe stress, infections, certain drugs or foods can cause the destruction of red blood cells. Certain examples of such triggers include aspirin, anti-malaria drugs, sulfur drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, naphthalene or fava beans. Pyruvate kinase deficiency is caused when the body is missing an enzyme called pyruvate kinase and with this condition the red blood cells tend to break down quickly. Acquired hemolytic anemias occur when the hemolytic anemia is acquired. In this condition, although the red blood cells may be normal, certain disease or other factors will cause the body to destroy the red blood cells in the spleen or bloodstream. With immune hemolytic anemia, the immune system destroys healthy red blood cells. The three main classifications of immune hemolytic anemia are Autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is the most common hemolytic anemia condition. For some unknown reason, this disease causes the body's own immune system to produce antibodies that start attacking our own healthy red blood cells. This disease may become severe and grow very aggressively. Alloimmune hemolytic anemia occurs when the immune system attacks transplanted tissues, a blood transfusion or the fetus in some pregnant women. This disease can occur if the transfused blood is a different blood type than our own blood and it can also occur during pregnancy when a woman has rhesus negative blood and her fetus has rhesus positive blood. Drug-induced hemolytic anemia occurs when a medicine triggers the immune system to attack its own red blood cells. In such case, one may be drug-induced hemolytic anemia. Chemicals in medicine, such as penicillin, can attach to the red blood cell surfaces and cause the development of antibodies. Mechanical hemolytic anemias cause physical damage to red blood cell membranes which can cause destruction at a faster rate than normal. The damage may be caused by changes in the small blood vessels or due to the certain medical devices high blood pressure during pregnancy called preeclampsia or a condition that causes seizures in pregnant women called eclampsia. Malignant hypertension or a rare blood disorder such as thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura that causes blood clots to form in small blood vessels throughout the body. Moreover, participating in strenuous activities can also result in blood cell damage in the limbs at times. With paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, the body will destroy abnormal red blood cells caused by a lack of certain proteins more rapidly than normal. Individuals with this disease are at increased risk for blood clots in the veins and low levels of white blood cells and platelets. Certain infections, substances and chemicals can also damage red blood cells resulting in hemolytic anemia. For instance, toxic chemicals, malaria, tick-borne diseases or snake venom. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
That is the end of this listening test.